Well, it's that time. Welcome, everybody, to Time Management Keys for the Nonprofit Leader. My name is Russ Siegel, and I wear a couple of different hats, as you can see there from the initial uh, slide. One of my hats is Executive Director for Sequoia Fund. We are a native community development finance institution located in Cherokee. We cover a seven county area, Haywood County West and the Koala Boundary. The other hat that I wear is as a speaker and a trainer and a facilitator with Briar Patch Communications, LLC. It's my company, uh, been in business since about 1999. And I wanna say a special welcome to those joining us from WNC Nonprofit Pathways. Thank you so much for sponsoring today's program. If you don't know about WNC Nonprofit Pathways, uh, it's something that you need to get familiar with. It's an organization that provides a lot of services to nonprofits in our area. So I'm going to go ahead and move to this slide. I want you to take just a moment. To, if you've not been to their website, uh, take some time this afternoon, visit their website, see what all they have to offer. There are a lot of training opportunities and, and other uh, things that are, are sure to strengthen and build your nonprofit in your area. One of the things that you may notice as we go through our presentation today is that my language may fluctuate between nonprofit and something else that I use to talk about nonprofits, and that's the word for cause. You know, sometimes uh, people get the impression that we're in the business to not make money. We're really in the business to further our cause, to do good things in our communities for our constituents and um, get work done that would not get done otherwise. And, and so I, I tend to prefer the term for cause. And so I don't want that to throw anyone off. If you hear me use that term interchangeably with nonprofit, uh, but that's just me. Today, we are going to have a fast paced hour talking about time management keys. I think confession is good for the soul. And so I want to begin by telling you that there's a reason I put together this webinar. This is a program that I've had for quite a while in various forms, but I am a, uh, a loafer by nature. I like to relax. I like to take it easy. And I do have a, a, a pretty good work ethic, but boy, when it comes time to relax, I like to relax. What I see in a lot of leaders these days is the drive to work, 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 and never enjoy the time that we have that truly should be ours. I believe that the true measure of wealth these days is not in money, but in discretionary time. Discretionary time is the time that we have that belongs to us. We get to use it how we want to. So the things that we talk about today, the things that I'm going to cover with you are not designed to help you pack more work into your day, although you're going to find ways to do that. What I'm really getting at today is ways to help you free up more discretionary time as busy professionals you need time to decompress, to enjoy your family, to enjoy your other pursuits. And so I want to help give you the tools to build in more discretionary time. Um, I, am, I am getting a, a notice here from, from uh, someone uh, that they are not hearing or seeing anything. Um, and again, Jeanette, I'm going to use you as my sounding board. Uh, if, if you're still able to hear me, let me know. Um, I do want to mention that not only can you download today's presentation, but it is going to be recorded. So fear not. If you have a connection issue, if you have to leave your computer for a while, if you need to go do something else, I completely understand. And uh, we will be sending you the link to the recording and you can hear it, this entire program at your convenience and share it with others uh, in your office and in your organization. So 
So Stanford University says that working longer doesn't work. Our productivity declines sharply after 50 hours, and it drops off so much after 55 hours, there's no reason for us to work anymore. In fact, in 2005, the BBC uh, reported on a, on a study that was funded by Hewlett Packard. Uh, it was conducted by the Institute of Psychiatry at the University of London and found that we become so distracted and so tired after 55 hours that our cognitive capacity is worse than a marijuana smoker. Uh, and so uh, if, if that's how you want to use your spare time is to stay home and, and do that, that's fine. But uh, we, we don't want to impair our cognitive ability by working harder. So what we have to do is find ways to, to be more productive in the time that we have. And we all have the same exact amount of time. It's the one resource that we share an equal amount of. So let's not think that we just have to pack more into the hours that, that we're given. Here's what executives tell me. Over the years, I've asked people who are far more productive than I am and far more able to use discretionary time. What's your secret? Uh, what do you what do you do? And, and that's the bulk of what we're going to talk about today. But overall, here's what they tell me. They just don't have time to take a vacation. They, they can't leave anyone else in charge, especially in the in the four cause world. We we have small staffs. Uh, we are uh, demanded uh, to do a lot of things. There are a lot of demands placed on us uh, by, by our boards, by our clients, our constituents. And you can fill in the blank for number three. Uh, just don't have time for whatever. Working harder and going nowhere. This is one that I hear quite often. Feeling burned out. If you're feeling burned out, that, that feeling can change. You can turn that around. But if you get to a certain point, there is a tipping point with feeling burned out that turns into thinking about leaving your job. What I've found out over the years is that people who start to think about leaving their job because they're burned out, don't unthink that. So we either have to make a change one way or the other. We have to either have to make a change in our lifestyle and the way we work, or we make a change in our career. And so before you get to that tipping point, uh, take some of the things that we offer today and implement them and see if that won't turn things around for you. Never have time to plan. Uh, if, if, if anyone feels this way, you are not alone. Planning is an integral part of what we do, yet the doing so often takes over that we don't feel like we have time to plan. And of course, we don't have any money. Small organizations especially don't have any money. So we have to do everything ourselves. I would like to know really quickly over in the chat function, if, if you would just go over there, and if one of these statements really hits home with you, uh, just, just type in a number of the statement that, that hits home with you. And uh, I'll take a look at that and, and I'll give you just a second. It's not an official poll. But I'd like to really know what, what hits home with you. What hit a little too close to home? Boy, six is killing it. <laughs> great, great. Thank you so much. It looks like uh, looks like six is the clear winner. Um, not not to say that that's a good thing because we we've all been there, and I'm sure that number six is not the only thing that hits home, but but it does seem to be the the one thing that we never have time for. And so I am going to give you some ways to to put time in your schedule for planning. In our day, there are some what I call common time vampires. These are things that we we suffer daily that, that have to be done. It's part of what we do. It's integral to our work. Yet, they're not always uh, necessary. It's not always handled the right way. We, we think that email is 
Uh, an easy way to communicate it is, but quite often we spend an inordinate amount of time in email when we could just make a phone call or deal with communication in another way and save some time. Uh, part of the problem with that is that, that other folks think email is a chat function and it is not. Think about it this way. If you got a letter in the mail, would you stop what you're doing and immediately write a response, put it in an envelope, stick a stamp on it, and run back to the post office to mail it and then stand there and wait for a reply? Obviously, that's crazy, but that's what we do with email. Meetings. Uh, I'm going to give you a link here in just a moment to go to a, uh, a blog post that will explain a lot of my views on meetings, but we're gonna cover meetings. Interruptions, multitasking, disorganized workspace, and what I call drifting the web. I'll explain that one too, uh, because I think surfing is a misnomer. What I'd like to do now is give you a quick poll that we will all be able to see, and I'll leave it up for just a couple of minutes. But I'd like for you to tell me really quickly, which vampire sucks the most time out of your day? Give it about another 10 seconds here. Okay, I'm going to stop the voting and you should you should see a uh, the result of the poll pop up and looks like reacting to interruptions uh, did did pretty well in, in the race. We're going to cover each and every one of these and I'm going to give you some tips on how to drive a stake through the heart of the time vampire. Because it's not email that's the problem. It's not meetings that are the problem. It's not the reaction to interruptions or it's not the interruptions themselves. It's not the multitasking or the workspace or the web. Those things are not the problem. They facilitate the problem and they can look a whole lot like the problem. The problem is in how we deal with these things. I like to think of what we're going to talk about today as retraining other people in how to deal with us and our time, how to respond to us. We're going to train people how to respond to us so that we make the most of our time and that we control our time. I believe that time is something that we can control. Uh, we, we can do a pretty decent job of managing time. But at its core, time is something that is to be controlled. Successful people have told me through the years that they make a conscious decision to control access to their time. And we can be smart about that and make sure that our work gets done and we're still nice people and that we are still fulfilling our mission. But we have to create ways to train other people. I believe one of the easiest ways to do that is through email. We are bombarded by email uh, every day. I know that I get between probably 50 and 75 email messages a day. How many of those need to be responded to uh, at all uh, is anybody's guess. It varies from day to day. Do all of those need to be responded to by me? Sometimes people send emails to me because I'm the executive director. It really belongs in someone else's lap. So because email is not a chat function, 
we need to have an email response schedule. If you've read the book, The Four Hour Workweek, by Timothy Ferris, you'll see that he goes on an email diet. He, he, he put himself on an email response schedule, checking email at first only two or three times a day. And then once he wrote the book and got famous, once a week. I suggest creating a schedule for yourself by where you check your email at 10 o'clock in the morning and somewhere around three or four in the afternoon. Those of you who know me know that I break this rule frequently. It's okay. Every rule has its exceptions, and I'm not going to sit here and tell you that everything I give you is going to be perfect for you. Pull out what works for you and discard what doesn't. But if you get a lot of emails that pull you into useless conversations that are frivolous or not business related, not not related to your mission, and it, it, it takes you away from your focus. Putting yourself on an email response schedule will start to train other people. We do this by creating an autoresponder. Uh, the autoresponder can be very, very simple. Now, the last slide you see today will have my contact information on it. If you need help creating an autoresponder for your email, you can send me an email and I will help you craft one. But your autoresponder can be very, very simple. Thank you for sending your email uh, in an effort to better serve our clients and our community. I am only checking email at you know, 10 o'clock and 3 o'clock each day. I will respond to your email at the next available time. If this is an emergency, please call my direct line at, and you give your phone number. What you'll find is that most of those urgent emails that were burning down the house when they wrote them are not going to be urgent enough to drive them to pick up the phone and make a call. You can also rest assured that as, as a couple of weeks go by, the people who are very serious about needing you urgently will pick up the phone. The rest will wait, and that's okay. But your autoresponder doesn't have to be up forever. I put an up, autoresponder up for about two weeks and was able to successfully train most of the people who emailed me on a regular basis to only send me urgent emails. I quit getting the cartoons. I quit getting the jokes, the political stories, the, uh, the dumb crook news, things that people thought I would be interested in. Uh, we, we drove all that stuff to Facebook where it belongs, but email is still the way we communicate on a business level, and we just have to retrain people that that's what we're there for. Your autoresponder can be short, sweet, nice, left up for one to two weeks, and you will see a dramatic decrease in the email interruptions that you have. I don't know why email providers put a reply all button on their email program, I, I think that should be, uh, I think the reply all button should be taken out into the public square and hanged before a large group of people never to see the light of day again, but it's there. Now, what happens though, when we click the reply all button? Folks, we live in the four cause world. We work with a bunch of nice people. So you know what happens. Somebody sends an email that has good information in it and you click reply all and you say, thank you. And then in the next 10 minutes, you get 500 thank you emails. No, thank you. Thank you. No, this is good stuff. Hey, go to this website and check this out. It's the never ending circle. So if you, if you remember one thing about email, it's just do not ever hit the reply all button. If you do need to reply, try to keep your reply to a five sentence maximum. If it takes more than five sentences, you probably should pick up the phone and make a call. Think about it for a second. You've sent these emails. I know that I have. You send a long email with many, many details. You give them the what, the where, the why, the who, the how much. Here are the directions to the location. Here's when to be there. Here's what to bring. Five minutes later, you get an email back that says, where do we go? What would you like me to bring? Folks don't read emails that are, that are long and detailed. We live in a Twitter world these days. Our attention span has been driven down to 140 characters. 
So when you do reply, when you do send an email, try to make it five sentences or less. That's going to keep things on focus and on task. And then you can always bounce back with, with another email, but it helps keep it focused. By the way, something I didn't mention and I've not put on the slides, but I wanted to, to tell you that focus is one of my favorite words. And I think by remembering the word focus and the acronym that it, that it represents will help us as we try to gain control over our time. FOCUS is an acronym for follow one course until success. Follow one course until success. That's going to hit us here in another uh, slide or two, but, but just think about that. As you, as you keep your email short and sweet, your focus is greater and the chance of, of uh, misunderstanding is, is severely decreased. Quick hits. If, if you do need to reply to an email, reply immediately. If it's, if it's 10 o'clock and you're checking email, go ahead and reply. Don't let that email sit half a day while you think about it. If you're checking email at 3 o'clock or at 4 o'clock, don't let that email sit around overnight. And I'll explain why in just a second. It's something called the Zygernick effect. But you want to go ahead and answer that email while it's fresh on your mind. If something doesn't belong in your lap, but it belongs with someone else, just forward it or forward with instructions. You don't have to reply and then forward. You just send it to the person who can best deal with it. If your email isn't something that you're ever going to reference again, if it's something that you're never going to need again, go ahead and delete it. It's okay to hit the delete button. I live by um, a law that I came up with several years ago called Russ's Law of Duplicate Concern. And that is if you hit the delete button on your email, you're not the only one with a copy of it. The sender has a copy, your Gmail has a copy, or your Outlook has a copy it's sitting out there in cyberspace somewhere. And I've had people who, who said, hey, did you get that email? And I don't remember getting that email. So could you send it again? I've never had it fail. They always find that email and send me another copy. In fact, this just proved true today. I had a conversation with a guy yesterday who sent the email. Uh, apparently, he sent it to the wrong email address, but he said, hey, did you get that email? It's pretty important that you res respond. I said, I just don't remember getting it. Could you send it again? I got it this morning. So the, the law of duplicate concern wins out again. Down at the bottom of this slide is, is uh, Asana. It's one of my favorite programs, and it will help you tame that email tiger. Asana.com is a project management program that is free for nonprofits and groups of up to 30 people. We use it internally here at Sequoia Fund, and we also use it with our auditors, our accountants, and other outside consultants and professionals who work with us. The problem I was having was I got so many emails every day, I would get an urgent request from the auditor, or our accountant would, would ask a question and want me to find a document. They send it in an email, and it gets buried, because if I didn't have time to respond to it right then, I may lose track of it. So at the end of the day, it's at the bottom of my email queue, and I lost it. And so Asana is a way that we can tie projects together. So when they send me a request now, I do get an email that says, hey, you've got a request in Asana. And they, they put a deadline on it because I love deadlines. Deadlines put pressure on me. They hold me accountable. And accountability is, is key to uh, – to keeping us on task and, and making sure our work is done. Even as leaders, we, we need accountability. So Asana is a, is a wonderful program. Check it out. There are others out there. There's Basecamp, which does cost money. There's Todoist. Um, there's, uh, there, there's several project management programs. Asana is the one that we picked. We like it. It works really well. And it gets urgent tasks out of the email loop so that nothing gets lost in the shuffle. But email, again, is just all about training people in how we answer them and how we, how we view email. It's not a chat. Now, meetings are probably my least favorite thing. I, I'm not a, a malanthrope. I, I love people, but meetings drive me crazy. 
again, it's not meetings that are the problem. It's how we deal with meetings. If, if you have a meeting, always have an agenda. Keep that agenda limited in scope. If you can have a meeting where you only do one thing, that's a great meeting. Meetings should not be for the purpose of sharing information. You can do that through email. Meetings are not for social interaction. You can do that in other ways. When you call a meeting, uh, you should have an agenda, a limited scope, no more than three to five things. Don't ever take your master to-do list into a meeting. Uh, those just those turn into chaos. And set a time limit. Jeff Bezos of Amazon has what he calls the two pizza rule. Never have a meeting with more people than you can feed with two pizzas. And when the pizza's gone, the meeting's over. I've talked with executives who have run meetings uh, standing up. Those meetings tend to be shorter and more focused. I've also talked to folks who uh, <laughs> one organization had a water bottle rule. Before the meeting, everyone was to drink a bottle of water. The meeting starts, and the first person who has to go to the bathroom, the meeting is over. So it forces you to get things done in a very quick way and stay focused. But smaller is always better. Basketball teams only have five players on the court at one time. Football teams only have 11 players on the field at one time. Navy SEAL teams only have, on average, four to six team members uh, in any one operation with a maximum of about 10 because the larger the group, the more chaos ensues. Smaller groups keep us focused. If someone doesn't have a purpose for being in the meeting, don't invite them. Don't put people in meetings just to say they were there. And you probably recognize this next line from your fundraising. Give, get, or get out. I have the same philosophy with meetings. If someone is not giving something to the meeting or getting something out of it, let them go. Set them free. Don't make people hang around just to take notes or to say they're, uh, they're there. You can be as egalitarian as you want to be in your organization, but for your meetings, you got to assign a leader. There's got to be somebody in charge. You can do this on a rotating basis. Uh, some organizations prefer to to do this on a, on a rotating basis in terms of the meetings or on a weekly basis. This week, so-and-so's in charge of the meetings. If you don't have a leader, someone to keep people on track, to keep the trains running on time, things descend into chaos and it becomes a social event. The leader is there to be the bad guy. The person who cracks the whip and says, hey, let's get back to what we're here to talk about. Also, when time is getting close and you, you've set your time limit, if you set 30 minutes for a meeting, that leader is the person who has to give you the two-minute warning. Let people know that it's time to wrap it up. And if you can't finish in the time you have allotted, you use that last two to three minutes to set another meeting. Don't let your meetings run over because the first time you let a 30-minute meeting run over to 35 minutes, the next meeting will be 45 minutes and so on. Also, assign accountabilities. Anyone who's at the meeting needs to walk away knowing what they have to do, by when, and who it needs to, uh, who they need to report to. Uh, if you don't assign accountabilities to everyone in the meeting, then they are not necessary. Make sure that everyone walks away from the meeting knowing what they need to do next, what their deadlines are, and to whom they need to report. You'll also see a link to my blog where I wrote a lengthier post about meetings. And there, I, I believe that uh, confession is good for the soul. And so, in that blog post, I will confess to you what my meeting-related nickname is. I've had it now for over six years. I wear it proudly. And uh, the people who, who work with me and for me finally get it after six years. And uh, they're, they're trying to steal my, uh, my nickname. But uh, I think you might find that an interesting little read. So managing interruptions, this was a big one on the poll that we that we had. Interruptions come in a variety of ways. It's not that interruptions are the problem, it's how we deal with interruptions. Interruptions can happen in person with people popping their head in the door. And, and a lot of us like to have an open door policy. I have an open door policy. The only time my door is closed is 
well, times like right now when I'm doing this, this webinar, I, I want to be accessible. We all do. Uh, but whether it's in person or email or on the phone, we have to train other people how to interrupt us. And, and there's a way to do that. Number one, we always need to make our agenda known. Uh, we have a brief two to five minute huddle in the morning where we talk about what's going on that day uh, just to make sure everyone is supporting everyone else and where are we going to be. I'll know not to take lunch at the same time as you, that, that kind of thing. And in that uh, meeting is when I make my agenda known. This is when I say things like I have a webinar from one to two. I'm not to be interrupted. I'm closing my door. We have to let people know when we're going to be busy so that they can respond appropriately. Once you make your agenda known, then other people can work around that. We have to decide, is this interruption urgent or is it important? Now, if the building is on fire, that's urgent. Drop what you're doing and get out. If it's important, is it also urgent? Is it, is it something that's important that maybe we need to spend some time on or is it worth dropping everything we're doing right now. What you'll find quite often is that those interruptions are neither urgent nor important. They just are. So we want to build time into our schedules for planned interruptions. We have to let people know that there's a certain time of the day when it's okay for people just to pop in, bounce ideas off of us, or, hey, I'll cover the phone for you for a couple of hours while you go to the doctor's appointment, or I, I'm, I'm willing to drop my agenda for this amount of time. And once people understand that there are safe places and safe times where they can interrupt you, that's, that's where their interruptions will occur. I also like to play the how can I help you defense, especially on the phone. Now, too many of us answer the phone the wrong way. We answer the phone by just giving our name and our organization. And we give no direction to the caller. If we don't give direction to the caller, the call belongs to them and we're just along for the ride. So anytime I have an in-person or a telephone interruption, if I answer the phone, my the way I do this is, is uh, thank you for calling Sequoia Fund. This is Russ. How may I help you? And hey, Russ, how you doing? Oh, great, Tom. How can I help you? Oh, listen, it's been a while since we talked. I was just thinking that I'd give you a call and fantastic. Glad to talk with you. How can I help you? In other words, I'm, I'm being nice, but I'm always driving them back to the point. And if they're, if they're just wanting to talk, then my response is, I'd love to talk with you. I am, I am buried right now. Could you call me back tomorrow between two and three? If this is important, he will call back. If it's not, I promise you'll never hear from him again. <laughs> we have to train people to, to follow our line of thinking, so to speak. So when, when you answer a phone call, and, and it's not always possible that you can put the phone on do not disturb for a couple of hours and work interrupted. Some of us just have to answer the phone, and I get that. So when you answer the phone, Start by playing defense. Defend your time by asking how you can help them. If they need help, they'll spill it and you can do it. But keep the phone call on track and keep things, keep things on, on focus and learn to say no. Uh, this is a trait that I wish I had learned at a much younger age. My grandmother is a master at saying no. She's so good at it. And it took me forever to learn this. And it took me a couple of times just be being so overextended that it almost wiped me out before I realized that saying no is okay. We don't have to say no to every request. There are some functions you just can't show up for. There are uh, some fundraisers that you have to send someone else because you can't be in two places at one time. There are some things that people are going to ask you to do that don't fall in your core competencies. And it's better to say no than to be embarrassed or to, to waste time that you know you'll never get back. But we have to learn how to direct people so that our, that our interruptions are, are managed in a way that, that they don't get control over our time. Um, and I want to say 
Uh, Sarah Stender from Asheville just sent me a, a message on the chat that she's rereading the four hour work week. Folks, if you can get your hands on a copy of the four hour work week, or if you can get the, the a version of the audio book, uh, it's worth it. I've, I've read it three or four times. Tim Ferriss is great. You may, uh, you may even disagree with about 50% of what he writes in that book. It's okay. The other 50% is gold. So I highly recommend the four hour work week. Now, what I'm getting ready to say next might be misconstrued. So I want to put a disclaimer on the front end of this. I do not want this to come across as sexist. I have a wife and two daughters who keep me in check. And, and so I don't want this to sound sexist at all. But women, you are better wired for multitasking than men. Now, when I say that, don't, don't let your head swell because there's a caveat. Women, while you are, there's a reason why women are mothers. Let's just face it. Uh, if it were up to us guys, a lot of kids would starve. So mothers, you, you can multitask women. You're, you're better wired for it. But when I say that, I, I say this, men are terrible at multitasking and women are only marginally better. Our brains are not wired for multitasking in general. Our limbic system is wired for multitasking. It's what keeps our lungs pumping, our heart beating, our eyes blinking. It helps us avoid danger, evade um, harmful situations. That all is a program that runs in the background of our operating system. We don't have to think about that, but it is wired specifically for multitasking. The rest of our brain is not. And so what we think is multitasking is not multitasking. It's just piling on a lot of things that get half done. The problem most of us have is this thing called a killer master to-do list. The master to-do list is that one piece of paper where everything we have to do at work, at home, at the kids' school functions, at church, at our social gatherings, everything goes on that master list. That master list then becomes a leviathan that rises up to devour us. Don't get me wrong, I still have a master list. But I also have a master don't do list. My don't do list is just as important as my do list. The don't do list tells me things like don't go to Facebook until you've completed certain tasks. Don't watch television until you've done this or that. It keeps me in check. The master to do list is a dumping ground for all the things that come across my brain that I think need to be done. But if I had to live by the master list, it would bury me. So. What we want to do is, is chunk that list down. The reason the master to-do list becomes such a leviathan and such a burden is something called the Zygernick effect. The Zygernick effect was, uh, it was originated by a, a Russian psychologist who theorized that all these things that we think about doing but don't do, they, they come back to haunt us. You, you know what they are. It's that stop that you meant to make on the way home, but you just forgot. And, and now that's all you can think about. Could you stop on the way home and do that tomorrow? Sure. But probably the Zygernick effect is going to make you get in your car and go out and, and make that stop. You're going to stop by the grocery store or the drug store. Um, the Zygernick effect is the thing that drives us crazy about not asking that person out in high school that we thought about all the time. It goes that deep. The Zygernick effect is also the thing that says if we put it on the list, now we're thinking about it. If it doesn't get done, it's going to cause us mental pain. So don't give in to the Zygernick effect. You can dump things onto your master list, but then there has to be some prioritization on there. Not everything on your master list carries the same weight. Some people use a one, two, three ranking or an ABC ranking. Whatever works for you works for me. That's fine. But if we, if we try to do too many things at one time, we suffer what's called the waste of half work. Multitaskers rarely get all the things done that they start. So if we're working on five projects at one time, we may have five projects that take us two weeks instead of working on one project at a time 
and finishing all five projects in a week. In the 1740s, Lord Chesterfield wrote uh, some letters to his son. And in one of those letters, he gave him this advice. There's enough time for everything in the course of the day if you do but one thing at once. But there is not enough time in the year if you will do two things at a time. Lord Chesterfield understood in the 1700s the waste of half work. We work faster, we work more focused, we complete more, and we're more thorough when we do one thing at a time. As painful as that is for those of us who, are, who pride ourselves on multitasking, we've just got to get over ourselves. It's time to lock the door. It's okay to lock out distractions. It's okay to put things uh, away that, uh, that are going to get in our way and, and just plow through that project. I'm going to show you a tool here in just a minute that I use, that I swear by, and it's a tool that almost everyone can afford, and it's, it's great. But you have three options with, with tasks. You can do it. You can delegate it or you can ditch it. Again, just like emails, just like phone calls, not every task that's assigned to you is worth doing. And not every task has to be done by you. At some point, we just have to ask someone else. We have to trust other people. If you have a staff, trust that staff to get things done. Delegation is another way of growing people in their jobs. It's another way of growing your organization to trust people enough to delegate important tasks to them and then spend our time checking on them rather than doing the tasks ourselves is a great way to develop people. For those of you who were in the Nonprofit Pathways uh, workshop a couple of weeks ago on the emergency succession plan, you know how important it is that we develop people to come up behind us and take on these roles because we never know how much longer we've got on this earth. So if we're not developing people uh, we're not helping our organization. So ask, does this have to be done by me? If it does have to be done by you, then set aside some time to work on that as a project. Now, some of us have very neat offices, and I commend you for that. I have worked very hard to straighten up my office. My apologies, I didn't click the button. So here you have your... Uh, Myth of multitasking. See, e even I don't get it right. So uh, dock my pay for that one. I'm sorry, folks. Um, thank you for reminding me. Uh, you, you folks out there telling me to change the slide. <laughs> uh, and again, I, I wish I could turn on your, your sound and let you yell at me. Uh, that, that's usually what gets my attention. Uh, but thank you. Thank you. There are some of us who have what I call a sedimentary filing system. A sedimentary filing system is a lot like the Grand Canyon. The oldest stuff is on the bottom, but we have to do some digging to find out what's down there and to find out just how old it is. The, the sedimentary filing system is that pile of paper on your desk. And I had a friend who, who had an answer for the sedimentary filing system several years ago. He, he told me to, to just get a banker's box, get an old cardboard banker's box. You can pick these up in, in packs of 10 or 12 at Walmart or a, an office supply store for not a lot of money. He said, rake that pile into the banker's box. If it's been sitting there for a while and you haven't touched it, just rake everything into the banker's box. Put today's date on it three months from now. Tape it shut. If in three months you haven't opened that box to get something out of it, recycle the whole box. Now, we have to be careful here because there might be some important accounting documents or grant documents in that box that we don't want to recycle. So that may not work for everyone. So let's try this instead. As you go through that stack, put like with like and create a home for everything. You have a home that you go to every day. Your car has a home where you park it every night. Your uh, telephone receiver uh, on your office phone has a home. Uh, when you open a notebook to pull out a grant document, that document has a home and, and it's in that notebook. And that notebook has a home. It's on the shelf in a specific place. We have to retrain ourselves to, to put things back where they're supposed to go. Just like mom always told us, put it, put it back where it goes. Have a home for everything. And that way, 
when we store these things away, we don't have to look for them again. We don't have to experience the waste of searching. And we can uh, we can access things a whole lot quicker when we do it that way. Home for everything and like for like. Think about your desk as a workbench. If you had a workbench with a hammer and a chisel and a planer and you did woodworking and maybe you've got a lathe, you want to know where those things are. But there might be some tools that you only use occasionally. You want to put them away so that they're not in your way, but you know where they are and you can access them. Your desk is a workbench. You have tools on your desk that are the same as a workbench. You need to be able to put those things where you can access them quickly and access things by frequency of use. We file things all wrong, and we have for years. The way we file things is generally alphabetically or chronologically or a combination of the two. We really should be putting things away by frequency of use. If it's something that we have to access on a regular basis, let's put it where we can get it. Like with like just means that all your office supplies go together, all of your documents go together, um, all of your notes and projects go together, all of your grant documents go together, all of your accounting uh, related documents go together. Again, it's, it's to, to minimize looking for things. And then the Japanese uh, industry came up with what they call the 5S process. And 5S, obviously, these are not Japanese words, but they have been translated into English as sort, which just means create a home for everything, put like with like, set in order. In other words, make your workbench as productive as possible. Put things where you can reach them. Several years ago, Starbucks did a spaghetti diagram where they brought in consultants and watched how people moved behind the counter as they made drinks. The average Starbucks worker was moving between three and a half and five miles a day in a very confined space because things were not set in order. They reconfigured that space. It increased their productivity. It, it was able to get them uh, uh, to, to, to make drinks a whole lot faster, walk a whole lot less. People became happier, more productive, and profits went up. Now. How can you create a, an orderly workspace so that you become more productive? Because, again, the more productive you are in the office, the more you can enjoy your discretionary time. Shine things simply means keep it clean. This sounds really simple and, and maybe childish. But if we go about keeping things clean and dusted, we pay attention to it. And as we pay attention to things, we improve things. Standardization just means that we don't have to reinvent the wheel when we have a form or if we have a, oh, let's say uh, a form that we use for uh, expenses, whether it's our expenses or a staff member's expenses, can we standardize that so that everyone fills out the same form, everyone knows exactly what they're looking for and looking at and moves through the process a lot quicker. When we have to reinvent the wheel every day, things slow down. Sustain simply means turn around and start the process over again. Once we think we've got it figured out, don't let momentum be your enemy. Start over. Look for something else to sort, for something else to improve. We have started to make a transition here to cloud storage. We have a very paper-heavy office, and most of the things that come in now are getting scanned directly into our system. Some of these things are getting scanned directly into cloud storage, and on a personal level, I use a program called Evernote. Evernote is free. They also have a paid version, but you can access documents on your phone, on your tablet, on your computer. From wherever you are, uh, you can use uh, your, uh, your Evernote to, to chase things down and, and all the documents are searchable. So you don't even have to remember what you're looking for if you remember a key word. So before I move on to the next slide, I do have a question here, some examples of what I mean by like with like. Uh, we we want to make sure that uh, we don't just have this master list of to-do items, but we also want to make sure we don't have a master stack of stuff. Um, I, I know that at one point in my career, 
I thought the way to clean my office was to take multiple stacks of stuff and just pile it up into one big stack of stuff. It really didn't improve things. It just gave me one stack to look through. Like for like means that all of our personnel records are together. All of our accounting records are together. All of our client records are together. We don't mix things. Uh, we have one shelf where we keep grant notebooks. And we know exactly where to go. We learned that the hard way because they were also at one time on a shelf with some educational curriculum and other things that that we just had because, hey, a bookshelf is a bookshelf. Shove anything on there and it's it's neat and orderly, right? No, create a shelf. In fact, I have a shelf, a bookshelf that I use to sort things. When we have loan documents for our clients, I have a shelf that uh, is for uh, loans that have already been closed, but maybe I'm waiting for another piece of information to to, to close out the file. Uh, if I have a, a client who is in trouble or needs some coaching, I have a I have a stack for that. So at any time, once that once that client comes to me and and we know that we need to coach them, I know exactly where their file is going to be. If there's uh, if there's something that needs to be scanned. Uh, I go ahead and put it in the two scan stack. Um, and a couple of times a week, I'll just go down the hall to our high speed scanner. I'll put it in the machine, let it run. And everything goes straight into our online document storage system. So uh, when I think of like with like, I think primarily of documents, but you can also think about it in terms of your office supplies. Uh, if, if you keep all of your staples together with your paper clips, that's a good example. It's very rudimentary, but that's just one one way of doing it. You can also do that on your computer. Now, computers are a little more sophisticated than they were when I when I first started, and, and it's a little easier to find things now because of uh, character recognition and OCR technology. You really don't even have to know what you're looking for to be able to find it on your computer. There are some folks who believe in, in creating files for like items in your email. If you use a system like Google, uh, Gmail, or, uh, or Outlook, you may be wasting time filing away your, um, your emails because everything there is searchable. So I've gotten away from, from email. I just I, I let everything pile up in my, in my inbox. If I need it, I go back and get it. If not, I'll just delete it at some point. Uh, but it's, it's not uh, as big a deal to me as it used to be. So let's take some surfing lessons, shall we? Oh, let me let me talk real quickly about shine because the uh, uh, the, the concept of shine. Someone had a question about that. Shine just means I'll give an example of what I do. A uh, couple of times a month, I go through my office and dust. Uh, I, I'm allergic to the world, so I, I, I have to dust. But it gives me an opportunity to put my hands on everything in the office. It gives me an opportunity to see some documents that maybe I missed that need to be handled, things that I put down inadvertently and didn't handle the first time around. I believe in touching things one time if possible, but in shining things up, it causes us to pay attention. Shining things up just means keeping our office clean, dust uh, free, um, clean our keyboard, clean the clean the monitor. As we clean things, that practice forces us to touch things that we can then do something about. If we ignore it, that's when the sediment begins to pile up and that becomes unproductive. So hope that answered the question. Let's uh, let's take a look here at surfing lessons. You see, we think about surfing the web, but if you think about surfing, you you get on the board, you paddle out, you you time your waves, you catch a wave and you surf back to shore. What happens though when we go online is that we build a raft and we drift aimlessly out to sea forever and ever. A couple of hours after being online, we don't remember why we're there, but now we know everything about the Kardashians. So we have to control our time online. I do that using a very simple sunbeam timer that you see there on the photograph. Uh, it doesn't take batteries. It has no electronic parts. You wind it up and it clicks until it dings. So for everything that I go online for, that I, I especially things that I'm not crazy about spending time on, I'll, I'll give myself a very short window. Make sure that when you go online during your workday, you have a clear outcome. 
You know why you're there and what you're looking for. Also know what type of information you're looking for. Are you looking for a downloadable PDF? Are you looking for a photograph? Are you looking for an infographic? Are you looking for a news article? Are you looking for a journal article? If you know what you're looking for and the, the format that you're looking for, it will speed up your search. Also set that timer. I usually give myself 10 to 15 minutes and then get away. Short bursts always work better. Number one, it's better for your eyes. It's better for your focus. And I believe in a 2020 schedule. My optometrist turned me on to this. He said, Russ, you spend all day long looking at a computer screen. Every 20 minutes, turn away and do something for 20 seconds. Even if it's just look across the room at a, at a painting on the wall. Look, at, look out the window. Do something for 20 seconds to take your eyes away from that fixed distance. If you can change what you're doing every 20 minutes, that's even better. You can go from working on the computer to answering phone calls, working on some documents, meeting with an employee or meeting with a client. Our brains are only wired to handle things in short bursts. And our attention span gets very exhausted after about 20 minutes. So if you can train yourself to work in 20 minute bursts, changing something every 20 minutes, it's going to work better for you. Now, if you're like me, you go online and you see something that you'd really like to read. Instead of spending time reading that uh, at that moment, uh, you can go to your browser. If you use uh, Firefox or Chrome, there may even be a version for Internet Explorer, but Internet Explorer is getting ready to be a dinosaur, so I would recommend something else. But you can get this uh, browser add-on called Pocket. Once you load Pocket, you see an article that you want to read, you click a button and you put that in your pocket. You can then open pocket on your smartphone, on your tablet, or later on your computer. It saves things that you can read and it puts it in a readable format that you can access offline. Pocket is one of my favorite apps that I use to save me time as I'm always coming across things that I would like to read but just don't have time for. So here are some keys. Our time's running short. I want to I want to go through these pretty quickly with you, but I think after what we've talked about, these will make a little more sense. Number one, people who are successful who I've talked to tell me the same thing, that they have made a conscious decision to control their own time. No one else gets to blow their day up by controlling their time. The successful leaders I've talked to also create a workday routine that they stick to. They build a framework where they know when they're going to check their emails. They know when they're going to return phone calls. They know when they're going to meet with staff members. They know when they're going to eat lunch. They put that on their daily agenda, and then they build other things around that. That gives you a place to put those interruptions. When you put those large critical items that you know you have to do every day, it creates a framework that makes it easier to get some of those smaller things done. If you think about that big red thermometer out at the courthouse lawn, that the Red Cross keeps their blood drive uh, uh, statistics on, and, and, the, and the, the more it goes up, the, the more blood they've collected or the more funds they've raised, uh, this is a visual indicator. Whether you keep a whiteboard or a chalkboard or something online that you can use to, to create a visual indicator of where you are, it will help you get things done faster and stay on track. Refuse to suffer unplanned downtime. I, I receive three magazines that I just don't have time to read. And so uh, when I get those magazines, I sit down with an X-Acto knife and I tear out the pages that I want to read. I staple everything together, and that gives me something to do when I have unplanned downtime. Uh, it's a lot more productive for my brain, and I don't have to worry about when am I going to get this done, because there will always be traffic jams and doctor's office visits where I'm waiting. But also, I build in personal time. This is time that you hold sacrosanct. Don't let anyone else interfere with the time that is yours, the time that belongs to your family, the time that belongs to your children, the time that belongs to you and your other pursuits. Just because we're committed to our work, we're committed to our clients, we're committed to our constituents, does not mean that our job has to own us. Plan your idleness, even if it means sitting for five minutes in the dark in your office, thinking. 
Planned idleness will help you be more productive than you ever imagined. We have to stop managing time. We have to start controlling it. So I leave you with this. These are the time control habits shared by the effective leaders. It's a rehash of what we've talked about. One thing that I didn't mention that I want to mention as we part, you'll see down on the left-hand side, do today's work today. Avoid the Zygernik effect. If there's an unpleasant phone call you have to make, it's not going to become more pleasant if you wait until tomorrow or until next week. Deal with today's unpleasantries today. Deal with today's tasks today. Don't carry that baggage home. Make it today. Do it today. You'll be more productive tomorrow. The last thing there is a little preachy, but it's absolutely true. People who have a regular bedtime, who get enough sleep, are more productive. I used to think that I could be perfectly productive on three to four hours a night. I was only fooling myself, folks. Don't fool yourself. Get plenty of sleep, especially as we get older. We need that rest to recharge our bodies, recharge our minds. Our organizations deserve our very best, and this is the way that we can give it to them. In just a moment, I'm going to give you a link to a survey. I know there are time is short, and I know this has probably felt like drinking through a fire hose. But I want you to take just a couple of moments and give us some feedback. Let Western uh, North Carolina Nonprofit Pathways know what you thought about today's program, what we can do in the future to, to provide you more relevant, timely uh, programming, uh, webinars, and how you want to see those delivered. That's going to be very valuable to us and hopefully valuable to you and your organization as well. I'm going to leave this up so that you'll have my contact information. If you if you uh, have a question that you want to uh, stay on here for just a few moments, and, and I'll, I'll try to answer as many questions as I can. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording, and I'm going to stop uh, the, the webinar because I, I did promise you an hour, and I want to, I want to let you go and, and spend the rest of your day putting some of this stuff into practice and doing your best work. I want to thank WNC Nonprofit Pathways one more time for their generous sponsorship of this event. Take advantage of all they have to offer. It will improve you, your career, and your organization.